أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد. Hello everyone and welcome to conversations about beauty and Islamic theology. A series that explores the rich and diverse intersections between theology, art, and mysticism. Now, today it is our absolute pleasure to host Professor Cynthia Robinson. Professor Robinson is Mary Donlan Alga Professor of Medieval and Islamic Art at Cornell University. Her research focuses on the relationships between religion, literature, and art, with a particular focus on Spain and the Mediterranean world between 10 and 1500 AD. Professor Robinson is also a published writer. Her debut novel, Birds of Wonder, was published by Standing Stone Books in 2018. Her short fiction has also been published by the Arkansas Review, Epoch, the Missouri Review, Slice, and others. Please see the description of this video for a link to her website. Professor Robinson, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me, Bilal. I've been looking forward to this. I was hoping to have us out in my garden, but oh man, it is really like the humidity is you could serve it up like ice cream. And so I, unfortunately, it's just, you'll have to imagine it's beautiful, but it's an imaginary garden, like so many, like so many of the gardens that we study. Okay, I'm putting myself into the Mediterranean climate for this conversation. Um, so Professor Robinson, much of your work offers a reconstruction of the court culture of Al-Andalus or Andalusia. Could you give us a very brief introduction to the Taifa kings and the Nasrids who, fo who formed the focus of some of your studies? So who were they and where were they based? Yep. The Taifa kings, I, maybe one of the reasons I was drawn to them was because Taifa in uh, the Hispanized version of Taifa translates as party. So in my head, party kings, <laughs> I was a graduate student, you know, party kings. Um, and it turns out that they were also that kind of party king. But um, taifa, as you know, means uh, a party apart. And so sorts of, it's when the Cordoban Caliphate fractured and fell apart. This was what came to be on the ruins of the Cordoban Caliphate, which took about, took about a century or so for it to really dissolve. And so you get these um, smaller kingdoms uh, in Seville, in Toledo, in Badajoz, in Zaragoza, which is the one that I am mostly concentrated on. Um, and these are just uh, kind of guys, if you've got four horses and you've got some guys that'll go with you and, you know, most of them had to kind of figure out how to coexist with their Christian neighbors and they did that pretty well. They made allies out of them. And for, you know, most of the 11th century, um, Al-Andalus was without a centralized state. Um, and so that was, um, that interested me politically that on the, because most of, most of the Islamic world at that time is, is really sort of under one of the caliphates, um, you know, pledging allegiance to the Abbasid guy. And this was before, this was before, um, really before the Fatimids got, really going. And so the idea that the Umayyad Caliphate that they had kind of set up, let's be, let's be frank, they just kind of threw that thing together. Um, it really just crumbled. And these kingdoms who didn't, none of them tried to um, stake a claim of kinship to the prophet. None of them really used the Umayyads as you know, kind of, oh, well, we're their inheritors, which they clearly weren't, but that hasn't stopped a lot of people from saying they're inheritors of someone throughout the Middle Ages. They, they weren't, there was no attempt to justify what they were doing vis-a-vis -vis the sources of power earlier. They just did it. And it, they turned into centers of, it made for a decentered kind of a uh, sources of patronage right, for especially poets. It was a very rich time for poetry because instead of one main court that you went and tried to get a job in and probably didn't because there was a line, um, there were suddenly, you know, 10 places that you could try your hand. And a lot of the poets that I studied for that book very clearly made the rounds of the courts. Um, the taifa in Malaga was Shiite, 
Um, they were very they were very publicly Shiite, and a lot of the um, a lot of the poetry that's dedicated to them, the panegyric that's dedicated to them, is uh, very straight up Shiite in tone by poets who will later go elsewhere and realize that that's not really the done thing, say in Zaragoza, and so you you know you recalibrate. The Nasrids, the Alhambra kind of fell into my lap. It was sort of like one of these, it's kind of like Michelangelo's ceiling. Like, I'm not going to write about that because is there really anything left to say about the Alhambra? Um, in the meantime, I had this other sideline that you probably saw on my website of, um, I'm also trained as a medievalist, as a Western Latin medievalist, whatever. That's how I started. And so... I had gone off into the deep, dark rabbit hole of Mudejar, mm. right, which is the, you know, the Islamic looking stuff that was used or made by or for Christians and Jews. And I ended up writing Imagining the Passion, which if you had told me 20 years ago that I was going to publish a book with the Pieta on the front of it, I would have said you were nuts. But hey, life takes, you know, like takes you strange places. So I got interested also in how the Nasrids would, I, I made the argument in that book that has really gotten some people's ganders up and that, that's okay. I don't mind that. I've got tenure. Hey, I don't care. Yeah. Um, but that I would use the word Sufism in the same sentence with the Virgin. What? No. So that, that told me I was onto something, right? And um, you can't, I, I just don't see how you have that long, if you want to call it convivencia and take it at, at its face, you know, living together of these three religious groups for so long. I don't see how you have that and not have each one of them deeply impact the other. Mm. Whether they want to or not. Right, whether they're whether it's because of polemic, or there's any number of very complicated reasons, and that that could happen, and paths that that could happen along. But the Nasrids became more interesting to me the more I realized how porous the boundaries were with their Christian allies. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, they're super, like their poetry is full of. Evocations of the Mu'alaqat. Um, they uh, want to argue not that they're descended from the Prophet. They don't go quite that far, although they do consider themselves a caliphate. They try to make that case. Um, they say that they're descended from one of the Ansar. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, Yemeni, you know, nods to Yemen and their poetry and, and stuff. But they're really. They wouldn't be there if it weren't for the Christians kind of shoring them up. They were, um, they were uh, tribute pay, they were allies of the Castilian king. They signed their names of Nasrid sovereigns signing treaties with him and witnessing documents. So on the one hand, and I think this is a commonality between the Taifas and the, between the Taifas and, and the Nasrids actually is on the one hand, there's a lot of creating a performance of Arab purity, right? The Taifas were really concerned about their Arabic not getting to dialecty, right? Of speaking extremely pure Arabic, although they have the Muashahat, right? That they, also, that they also deal with, they also produce. But they have a hyper-consciousness of themselves as Arab or wanting to present themselves as Arab, which is total performance because by this time they were intermarried with the Christians you know, we know there were blonde, uh, blue-eyed caliphs in Cordoba, so just imagine what they looked like by the 11th century once they moved north. Um, and the Nasrids also have this thing about pure Arabic and, like I said, nods back to the Mu'alaqat and to Yemen and to the Hejaz, uh, to Naj. To the, there's a Naj is a constant theme in their poetry. They name one of the hills up from the palace. They call it Naj. But at the same time, they're very, they're in the Western Mediterranean, they are very threatened on all sides, and they make alliances accordingly. Um, and I've, I found some stuff in their, in their Islam 
that made me kind of go, just the same thing that I found about the Castilian version that made me go <laughs> and got me a screaming review from a scholar I won't name in Speculum saying, no, this can't be right, this can't be right, which was kind of the same thing that happened when Juan Carlos Ruiz Sosa proposed that the Palace of the Lions was a madrasa in an article back in 2001. Which I, it, he kind of has, it's, he's got a point. I think he's right. It may need to be tweaked, but I think he's right. The, the Almohad mix, they, they're, they're not as mixy-uppy with the Christians. And I think that is, like, they're very, that's part of their calling card, um, or the Jews. And I'm sure there's ways that those things happen. I'm sure Jessica will tell us about it in, you know, five years when she writes her book. But they didn't look to me as interesting uh, as hybrids as the other two. Uh, thank you so much for that really terrific. Um, uh, thank you so much for that really terrific introduction, uh, Professor Robinson. And I'll just talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps you can um, talk to us about some of the architectural spaces uh, that these patrons and poets were um, gathered together in, and perhaps you can give us an idea of what transpired in these particular spaces. Well, I will start, I'll, I'll just say, I'll come, I'll circle back around to the Alhambra, but I'll just say that the Alhambra is, with the exception of the Top Capo, which isn't really medieval, it's kind of more early, it's, it's later, right? Um, but certainly as a medieval palace space, a medieval Islamic palace space, despite all of the renovations and all of the things that have happened to it um, over the years, the alterations, you know, starting with Ferdinand and Isabel to, to begin with, um, the Alhambra is the biggest and best preserved Islamic palace complex that we have. And it has an enormous corpus of inscriptions. Um, it had be a, both poetic and uh, otherwise. Um, it's, but it has so long kind of been run through the filter of Washington Irving. The fact that it's been viewed uh, even by scholars that are our contemporaries that I'm not going to name, but you know, you can scroll through my footnotes and you'll find it. Um, scholars who even today consider the Alhambra um, somehow not as good as what's coming out of the East, right? The Mukarnas is not as clean and crisp, right? The vegetal themes persist. And because we have this idea of there's progress in art and somehow progress in the Islamic world, if we're going to, if we're going to assume instead of just monolithizing, which we've learned not to do by now, hopefully. Um, so if we're going to, if we're going to let them be a discipline like everyone else, then we have to put, make them teleological, like we make everything else. And so progress means you leave all the vegetal junk behind and you make some nice, crisp, clear mukarnas, which the Almohads actually do. Um, but the Nasrids very quickly come back like with the vengeance, with the garden stuff. Um, so I think the Alhambra is I hope the day comes that people study it who are not Hispanic, right? The way Islamic art, you, I mean, I, I don't think we should go back to the days of, well, it's all the same. And if you're an Islamicist, you're an expert in Baghdad and, you know, Cordoba and everything in between and over in Tehran. No, that's, that's not reasonable. And that's, that was, a field that was a product of colonialism, and it's good that we're evolving beyond that. Mm. But Al Andalus is still considered sort of the um, it's the precinct of Hispanists because that stuff is weird, and I don't think we get enough. I think we're doing a disservice to the field if we don't consider the Alhambra as a fully integrated. We don't have anything else. The Mamluk palaces are in bits and pieces, right? We don't have anything else um, that, of that magnitude. And the field is not getting what it could be getting out of the Alhambra. 
by ghettoizing um, by ghettoizing all Andalus, I think. So that's my little soapbox piece. Um, the palace in Zaragoza that I worked on, the Aljaferia, um, it's one of the sort of fortress palaces that are typical, the Hosun, the Hisun, the Hosun, that are typical of the 11th century that scholars like uh, Thomas Glick uh, a number of decades ago related with the dissolution of the caliphate, right? And the, the need that you're gonna have and that we see happen in Aleppo, Yasser Tabaz's work showed that um, that when the governing uh, group is not mostly not of the group that it pretends to govern, it frequently will go out of the city and build a sort of fortress palace, both for looks and also for practical reasons. The same reason that um, the Abbasids moved out of Baghdad, kind of apart and with a fortress look. Uh, to the to the Alhazaria, um, I believe that it was also the setting of these majlis uh, ceremonies that are, and I haven't been gainsaid um, by any of the people, any of the sort of hardcore archaeologists that I met there. One of the thing that really clued me into that. Um, on, on the one side, when I was doing the dissertation, um, I had this building that I wanted to study. And on the other, I had these huge corpus of um, poetry that were published. It's not like I had to go digging, you know, for the poetry, it was published. Um, and a lot of it, you know, would say in the rhymed prose introduction that it was you know, such and such a poem was was improvised um, at a certain court on a certain day, which may, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was spontaneous, maybe not, but that's, but they wanted you to know that this was in Zaragoza, and a lot of it was in Zaragoza. Some of it was in Seville, some of it was in Badajoz, but a lot of the stuff was happening in Zaragoza. And they would give you this rhymed description, uh, rhymed prose description of fr a frankly paradisiac garden setting in which the gathering was happening, um, in which such and such a poet would stand up and recite, yada, yada, blah, blah, would be always with garden themes and sackies. And I, I, I never get bored with this stuff. It's very same. Um, they're drinking, so they probably have a high tolerance for, you know, they have high tolerance for repetition of the songs. And it dawned on me one day that I'm sitting in, the, I'm sitting in there and you can't see, it's not like the Alhambra or not like so many other palaces, um, the Top Kapu, the um, Medina to Zahra, uh, what we know of the palace into later from text. This is not a room with a view. This is um, a walled space, right? Very high walls. The view is the courtyard. Um, and the vegetation that they're describing, there's room for some, garden stuff, probably, although it's, there's, there was a pool, there's, they're going through a little bit of what the Alhambra went through with the floor in the Palace of the Lions, deciding what was there and what sort of text and what kind of, you know, what's your source that's going to tell you what was there. It's pro it probably was not a plantless space, but it was definitely not Medina to Zahra with the vista onto gardens. The gardens were stucco. The gardens were in the ornament. Um, and the ornament is dizzyingly complex, um, amazingly complex. It's um, clearly riffing off of the Mosque of Cordoba, the sort of interlacing arches and the polylobed arches, but it's on, it's high. You know, it's like it, it interlaces, it overlaps. The vegetation is incredibly dense. Um, in my first book, I have a chapter that really walks you through looking at this ornament, which I believe they did because there's nowhere, you know, they're not looking past it out to a garden. It's what you see around you. And if you are there every day or every other day, or you're a regular at these parties, or you live there, um, you're going to become intimately familiar with it the same way you would become intimately familiar with, you know, a painting that you have in your house. Um, and so I believe that these, uh, these garden, these recreated palaces with gardens, um, using synecdoche, synecdoche and metonymy, and it's not like an image of a palace, like in the Mosque of Damascus. 
it's elements, columns, arches that are repeated ad infinitum on a circular grid, um, overlapping circles that you really have to, it's asking you to sort of unsnarl it. And if you sit there long enough, you do. And I think that's what part of what was going on in here was it was, it was inviting you um, to puzzle over it. Uh, these guys weren't Sufis yet. They, they were clearly in, um, in Sida Batav Yauzi, who's one of my main sources that I use for the 11th century. He was conscious of the Sufis. He knew what they thought, but he was also very careful to maintain himself. Like, I don't believe you can get there in this lifetime. Right. I believe the intellect can give you an experience that is analogous to that. Mm. But the fact that he thought that he had to stipulate that probably means that he was surrounded by at least some people who did think that. Sure. Right. So I wouldn't say I was looking at one of your questions, like the asking, do I think mysticism, you know, did it dictate? I think it absolutely dictated the Alhambra for sure. But I don't, I, I think something very akin to mysticism that they're very careful not to call that uh, dictated the Alhambra, right? Ibn Sido Bataliyazi has a lot of discussion of the way the cosmos is put together on, um, on, on semicircular grids, how the intellect um, becomes a circle uh, having contemplated the full moon. And then he writes poetry that he also comments. It's very Ibn Arabi. He comments on his own poetry. And it's, this, it's these drinking songs with the Saki, who's the full moon, who is at the nexus between the worlds, right? He's doing all the Ibn Arabi things, but he's making sure you understand every other word that this isn't Sufism, okay? This is, <laughs> this is rational. This is the intellect that is doing this. We're not having a union with God, okay? Just, just let's, let's be clear about that. But it's this really cool, you know, planet with these. It's a Sufi cosmology that he's very careful not to call a Sufi. Um, and I think that that, I think it's reflected in the ornament around them. Um, and it's, um, it's an endlessly fascinating stuff to stare at. I could stare at it all day long. And, and one of the things that made me sort of convince me that this is what was going on in there is in the Northern Salon, there's an inscription. We're, we're not as blessed with a huge corpus of inscriptions as we are at the Alhambra. The Alhambra is just, it's embarrassed de richesse in terms of you know, the inscriptions that you have. Um, but there's an inscription, there's a Quranic inscription that goes around the Northern Salon, which both served as the throne room and also on a different axis that takes you into the little prayer hall. So it kind of, it's a small palace and it's doing double duty, this, this room. And the inscription was at a weird level. I'm like, why is it all the way down there? Um, and one day I was sitting cross-legged on the floor <laughs> and I was kind of, you know, getting my notes together that I had just taken. And I was like, wait a minute, that's, I, that's at the height of my eyes mm. if I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor. Oh, um, so that's, that's kind of what made me go ahead and want to go there and say this is a place where Majlis, this is for Majlis, Majlis. And there are other areas of the palace that were present in the 11th century that are so altered that we don't really, you know, it was a barracks, it was a monastery for a while after the, after the Almoravids ran through there and they lost it to the Almoravids and then, then some, some French monks set up shop in there for a while. Then it was the Ferdinand and Isabel did stuff to it. Um, uh, the Aragonese royal house before them did stuff to it. Uh, it was a barracks again in the 19th century. So it's just been through all sorts of, of changes. And I don't think we really know exactly what was present um, in the non-central areas of the palace, right? So there could have been rooms for other purposes. Um, but this, I'm pretty convinced that that's what was going on in here. And Professor Robinson, you're, I mean, just to, just to return to that, um, 
that kind of interaction because it really emerges in your work that kind of confluence of poetry some kind of like miss some certain mystical ideas or perhaps theological ideas the majlis the kind of entertainment environment these kind of practices that took place the majlis um i was wondering if you could perhaps speak to us about that kind of relationship between let's say practice or performance whether that be music or poetry or uh, debate and the kind of the way that you see architecture in the inscriptions and perhaps give us some um, specific examples of that. I'm going to use the Alhambra because I think it's easier to do uh, that way. Um, one of the things that I think distinguishes Islamic art from the, the, it's medieval contemporary, and I get these I get these questions um, from students. I'm teaching a course with my colleague Ben Anderson that is um, it's medieval art that brings it all together, right? It's 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 the Mediterranean basin, it's Islamic, it's it's Christian. He's a Byzantinist. Um, this is not the kind of course that I think anyone in their right mind should try alone. Um, because you don't have the expertise, but with the two of us together, we've managed to, we're going to eventually write a textbook. We're being lazy, but we're going to eventually produce a textbook. And the second half, he's early and I'm late um, with a few crossover exceptions. So the second half of the semester is a lot of me and it's a lot of Islamic stuff. And the students have been, uh, you know, we've had the Atonians, we've had the Carolingians, we've had the earliest Islamic stuff, which is fairly figural compared to the rest of it, right? You've got um, the Mosque of Damascus, you've got the, um, well, the, the Abbasids are pretty abstract, but there a lot of their luxury arts have, you know, images that you can interpret, right? That you can say that is a dancer, that is a thing, that is a mosque on the, you know, whatever. Um, and as we move through time, the abstraction takes over. Mm -hmm. And I always get questions about, well, how do I know if it's vegetation? Because mm -hmm. if we're in the Western part of the Islamic world, a lot of it is, is vegetation. How do I know if it has mystical meaning? And they want me to talk to them about iconography, like we talked about, like we'll have just had Moissac and Chartres, and because this is all in the same course, because we believe it should be, because that's what the medieval, that's what the medieval Middle Ages were. It was not, they weren't divided into these different areas, but it makes it so much harder to teach, because I have to say context, and context is sedimentation of knowledge, and you can't expect an undergrad to give you full-on context for the Dome of, Tlen of Tlemcen, right? That's, I can't even give you that, and I wrote a long article about it. And so the tricky, I, I know as art historians, and you're sympathetic to this I think, uh, as am I, more than other people who are more married to the images because you're, you know, a calligrapher. Um, I'm a writer. Like, I, I was constantly having to be dragged by Renata out of, she said I went down the rabbit hole, little did she know, of, um, of poetry. And I did. It just went, wow, wow, and it's got theory. Oh, my God, this is great. And she would have to be like, Cynthia, um, art history, hello, the building? <laughs> Uh, right? You talk about the palace. Um, but unfortunately, I think all of that is necessary if you want to really understand the stuff. And that's a tough thing to, it makes it hard to teach. I don't, I'm good to teach it that way because I'm not going to give them the, you know, it all means paradise spiel or the it means nothing spiel which there is that out there as well. Um, but I think it is extraly determined and I, that's probably gonna get me thrown out of the art history club. Um, but if you're in 
the Palace of the Lions, right? And if we believe Juan Carlos Rizofa, um, and I do, um, his argument about it being a madrasa makes more sense every time I read his article. Um, and I've been there with him a couple of times and he's a really great guy. Um, who is, you can, you can edit this out if you want to, but I just wanna, every time I speak of him, um, he's recovering from, a, from brain cancer right now. Okay. And so every time I mention him, I just always wanna send him, we need you, <laughs> you know, the field needs you. We need original minds like yours, please don't, please, please get well. Um, but he is, he's not an Arabist and he will be the first person to tell you I am not an Arabist. Yeah. But what he is, is a really astute observer of architecture. Right. Like I will never be. Um, I've been to like Las Huelgas with him, which is of course one of the first big Mudejar, manifestations of Mudejar near, near Burgos. And the man can read a building, he has the gift of reading a building like very few people I've ever seen. And the way he makes the case for, um, for the Palace of the Lions being a madrasa is purely good old art history compare and contrast. Um, what does this look like? Well, it looks a lot like the plans of the madrasas of the Marinid kings. Mm, Lo and behold. Um, and later, not too many years ago, it was determined that because they, they've had pebbles on the floor of the Palace of the Lions, they've had bushes that look stupid, they've had all sorts of just they didn't know what to do with the floor. And there's a line in one of the poems um, from the Hall of the Two Sisters that makes reference to the Queen of Sheba and the, the you know, the picking up of the skirts, that whole Quranic anecdote. And there'd been a school of thought out there that was sort of like, you know, the floor was probably white marble. And a lot of people were sort of, no, 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 no. And then, and one built by, with huge input from Ibn al-Khatib, who's another victim of the kind of, Al-Andalus, they weren't real Muslims. Right, because they got taken over by Fernando Nisabel. They were basically just, you know, ay, estos reyes, you know, when will they finally get here, kind of thing. No, um, or he's not a real Sufi. And I've had this argument with a very, you know, dear friend in Granada with whom I recently co-edited a book on the Palace of Dar al -Hurra. No, it's por política. It's because of politics. I'm like, no, you know, the guy wrote a two-tone treatise on mm. Sufism. That's not por política. If anything, it got him in trouble. It did. It got him killed. Um, and there's a, there's a whole argument out there about whether Ibn al-Khatib's trial was, um, there's a very good article by Ali Akhtar, um, who was one of my students at Cornell in Ijmet, uh, going through all the sources of, um, was Ibn al-Khatib's trial, was it really motivated because of heresy? And people have wanted to poo-poo that and kind of poo-poo the Islamicness of the Nasrids in this weird way, which when you when you think of scholarship going through the period of Franco, like who was around, who got to stay, right. who didn't, um, who towed the line, who didn't. I mean, the Spanish Spanish scholarship on their own Islamic past has revolutionized over the last 20, 30 years. There's some fantastic scholars working there. And there's also some very difficult to kill um, mm -hmm. stereotypes that really prohibit, like, again, we have Ibn al-Khatib's treatise, the Raudat the tarif bel Habu Sharif is a big treatise on Sufism. It's two volumes like this. It's enormous. Is it translated? No. Um, that just gobsmacks me. Like, that is you know, he's clearly in contact with copies of it were sent to Cairo, right? No. Uh, he's clearly, he's in contact with people in North Africa. Um, our knowledge of, of Sufism in the late Middle Ages, we bemoan the fact that we don't have any text. Yes, we do. <laughs> we have this 
big thing over here. And it's really interesting. And it's really different from the Sufism that's practiced further east. At the center of it is a tree, okay, that he addresses as a lady. Hello, Virgin Mary. Um, just so interesting. And it's just, oh, well, por politica. And this is someone whose level of Arabic runs circles around mine. You know, I'm not going to tell you I'm a fabulous Arabist. I'm, I'm decent. I'm all right. You know, I can handle it. I'm an art historian. I'm allowed. But the reason that I find myself having to do that work is because no one else has. And no one else is interested in doing it. And so I take my Hans Baer and my, you know, my gazillion dictionaries and in I go. Um, but that's, it's like the Alhambra. Mm. Ibn al-Hatib's treatise has met the same fate as the Alhambra, which is, oh, you know, um, we know there was, we, we know the, the Sufi festival, the big festival that took place in the, um, in the area that has been most messed with, uh, beginning with the Reyes Catolicos, the coming up, like when you come into the 14th century entrance, not the touristy going past the gift shop one, now the one when you go up the hill. And there's this, um, there's a, a, an esplanade that would have been open uh, in the 14th century. And we know that that's where there was a one-off, um, there was a, a, a one-off celebration of the Molid, right? Oh, wow. And okay. There's really good textual evidence of this. Um, there's been some recent work by Antonio Orihuela and Olga Bush's dissertation touches on this. I have, so for the longest time, um, what was out there about the performance was a text that was chosen and translated by the very great Arabist. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not besmirching his credentials as a great Arabist, Emilio Garcia Gomez, who um, had gone through this, you know, knapsack at the bottom of the dust, dust at the bottom of the traveler's knapsack. And this is Ibn Khatib looking back on this occasion uh, from a position of exile some some years later, uh, and it's taking place in the 1360s. I'm going to say 1363. Um, I won't find that in blood just in case, but it's, it's December 1363. And he goes through the whole, mo most of the question about this, this text was, did it tell us where this party took place in the Alhambra? And a lot of people had wanted to say it was the Palace of the Lions, which just doesn't make any sense because there's a big fountain at the middle of it. They'd all have fallen into the fountain, just but people had wanted, you know, really wanted to make it the Palace of the Lions for whatever reason. And they were gradually kind of coming around to the idea that it was this esplanade. And the text that Garcia Gomez chose to translate was the description of the area right? The description of the people who were there, um, the order of the festivities, all of which is very informative and very interesting. Um, sidebar, Ibn al-Hatib says, um, makes a, a, a reference to the wedged, well, muta wedged, the ones who, and that has always been interpreted as those who attained mystical ecstasy and those who were faking it. But it seems like a better translation. I've, I've done some reading more recently into, um, into uh, folks who kind of take the Sufi thing seriously. I think part of the problem is that people don't take it seriously. Um, I'm agnostic. I'm, I was brought up, you know, I was brought up in the Bible Belt of the United States going to, you know, <laughs> church every Sunday. So I had enough church for 20 people. Um, I'm of an agnostic bent, but I'm very, very interested in and attracted by mysticism of all varieties. And I think a lot of the people who study it don't take it seriously, right. um, and which is too bad because most of the people who practiced it in the Middle Ages took it very seriously. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. And it seems that the better translation of Mutta Wedges is apprentices. For the, purposes of, for the purposes of this text. 
And so there again, you've got people say, oh, well, this wasn't real. You know, they knew it wasn't real. He knew, see, he called them fakers. They knew it wasn't real. And there was, there were these long, long, long casitas that were produced for the occasion that Garcia Gomez says, I'm not going to translate those because we all know that Nasrud poetry is crap and that it just repeats, you know, it's just encyclopedic. Um, which I don't necessarily think that's bad, but encyclopedic as a word to refer to the later Middle Ages is like it's tantamount to bad, um, you know, not new and not innovative and, and whatever. So my colleague and I realized, oh my God, no one has worked with this poetry because Garcia Gomez said it was crap. And most people would rather read his translation than go back to the original Arabic because granted, it's hard. Um, and so for the longest time, this event in this palace has been studied without a consideration of the main event, what was for them the main event, which was the recitation of the poetry, which was where all the Sufis were dancing. I mean, they invited, you know, the guy invited, um, there's, there's a description of Muhammad V's tent in this esplanade is beautiful. And, and Olga Bush does justice to the tent. I will give her that. It's, her treatment of the tent is very good. Um, and it was set up with uh, a pond that may or may not have been made for the occasion. It may be the little, the little pool that's there now, probably not, but some sort of a water feature was part of this. Um, all sorts of lighting devices were fabricated for the occasion. Um, and all these tree terms are used to describe um, to describe the lighting devices. They were clearly kind of making a kind of mise en scène of, as the poetry tells you, a desert scene in kind of Mo'alakat land. Um, and I'm being told by, that my connection is unstable. It doesn't. Maybe it means I'm unstable. I don't know. Um, but it's, I wouldn't, they'd get no argument from me on that. Um, but they, the, the ornament plus the voice of the guy who is singing, who is brought in specially for the occasion. And there's a, you know, there's an, a, there's a, a, a bit about him in the text of Garcia Gomez that did, that did get into his translation. He was known as al Mosili, So he was from, he was from Iraq, but by way of the Marinid court. And so they had gone considerable to considerable lengths to get this particular guy, right, to do the performances of these casitas that were written specifically for the occasion. And it is pretty clear that it was on the basis of those words that these people became wedged and muta wedged. And you can do what you want with that, but that's what they're telling us, right? that the sound, the light, the ornament on the textiles of the tent, and it appears that the textile of the tent pretty much replicated the style of ornament that we associate with, um, that we associate with the Alhambra. Right, wow. Oh so, yeah, <laughs> yep. And then the next day, maybe, you know, in the area of the palace, which is adjacent where the sovereign heard you know, complaints from the locals. Uh, maybe it was the, you know, Thursdays were apparently the day that people brought complaints to him. Well, that same ornament is probably not acting on them in that way. I'm going to guess that no one had mystical ecstasy in the context of, you know, this guy stole my cow. Um, maybe they did. If, if so, good for them. But it's, um, it's the same ornament. And this is a, con a concept that I find is very frustrating to students. Right. That you can't say it's definitely this or it's definitely that. Mm. There's no kind of iconographic specificity in this case. You know, it's, it's shifting. Well, there is at the moment, mm. right? It's, and it's the poetic language that activates it. Mm. And the oral, the the lip, the hearing or the pronouncing, right? That is almost like plugging the lights in on a Christmas tree. Um, 
and that I, that is it's 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 tough to get across because these are inter, this is an introductory course, right? So it's not these. There's no way these kids have Arabic unless they've learned it at home. Um, most of them, it's their first art history course. Although by the end of the semester, you know, not everybody gets to have an A. Sorry, um, you know, some people do. That's what a lot of them think is, well, I'm at Cornell, so I should always have A's. No, um, you got A's in high school so that you could come to Cornell, and now you will get the grades you get at Cornell. And the ones that, um, you know, there are those who rise to the occasion. It is possible. Like, I know that it's teachable because some do, and when they do, they really get it. Mm. Um, but this is really at the root of, you know, we, we have the same kind of leaf on a soup bowl, and I'm not telling you that they're looking at the soup bowl and, you know, seeing the face of God, um, which is what a lot of the more kind of monolithizing approaches to art history, to Islamic art history, would be like, it's all about the oneness of God. No, it's on a soup bowl. It's not about the oneness of God. It's pretty. It looks nice on the table. Um, yeah, it's the same leaf that got the guy to the state of wedged in the mall. I'm, I'm sorry, I, that's, that's just the way it is. <laughs> I don't have an explanation for you. I'm just telling you that's how it was. Um, and then if you go over to the Madras, to, to the Palace of the Lions, incidentally, we know that the medieval name of it was um, Riyadh Asaid which ain't the Palace of the Lions, okay? That's, that's yeah, 19th yeah. century. Um, and I, have, I teach a, writing, a freshman writing course on the Alhambra, and we read Washington Irving because Washington Irving is fun, and we write fan fiction on the basis of Washington Irving. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. But we have to recognize that that's not – it's 19th century looking at it. It's not – they didn't call it the Palace of the Lions. They called it um, Arriara Said, which leads me back to the whole importance of all the garden, the, the, the just sheer quantity of garden references and metaphors in the ornament, much more so really than in the case of the, uh, the, Alha the, the, the Alhafriya is, it's there, but it's part of the system. It's got these architectural metaphors, these architectural metaphors sort of mixed into it. The garden thing for the Nasrids was everything. And you find it, you know, the garden of knowledge of noble love. I mean, you know, the garden and tree references are also present in the public madrasa in Granada. Um, so when you come over to the, um, let's call it the madrasa, I'll do that, why not? Um, then the kind of intellectual activity that is set off by these same, by these same motifs, right? The, what, the poem around um, the hall of the two sisters says, contemplate my beauty and you will understand my essence. Um, so beauty through beauty as a path to knowledge, and the knowledge is ultimately going to get you to the mutawajids over that way. But this is the you know this is where we study. This is the um, leading you to understanding, which will eventually lead you to this other this other realm if you choose to go there, um, if you are able to go there. Uh, and the poetry also makes clear. You know, I don't think Muhammad V had mystical ecstasy. I think he was he was a voyeur, which is a little creepy. Um, the idea of him just sitting there watching, but um, having been to Malad celebrations, um, our the woman who cleaned our apartment in Egypt, um, she showed up and said, "We I cleaned this apartment," and it made me a little squeamy because I don't I clean my own house, but you know she had the job, so okay. Um, we mostly sat her down and made her talk to us in Arabic because being you know, being women, the number of opportunities that you have to go out and mix with the population and just chit chat um, without consequence uh, is, is less than for men. And so we mostly were just like, Fatima, we just want to talk to you. <laughs> what? You don't want me? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I have to clean. Well, go ahead. Clean the bathroom, but whatever. And then come back and have tea and talk to us. And after the second or third time, she's like, yeah, okay. 
cool. You know, <laughs> I like this job. This is good. Um, and so she invited us um, to go with her. Her brother-in-law was a big sheikh in his local sort of order or whatever um, in, in the region of Tanta. And so she took us to the Melid. And it is those who do it are watched by those who aren't doing it. And so that's um, it, it's fine. That's what happens. And so that's what, um, that's what Muhammad V was doing. He brought all these Sufis that were potentially politically problematic for him. Uh, let's just be frank. Um, potentially very politically problematic for him because they, you know, they were very popular. Um, and he brought them on this occasion and had this lavish festivity. And it was a one-off. Um, to our knowledge, it was never repeated, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, at one point, it was really desirable to ally yourself, right? Um, and then not. And then Ibn al-Khatib, you know, there's a whole, like, I think if we took Ibn al-Khatib and his writing seriously, that thing should be translated. I am not the one to do it, you know, but it should be translated. It should be available because what they're getting him on or what they claim to be getting him on um, is the whole concept of hulul or what we all refer to as wahdat al-wujud, which is not an Ibn Arabi concept. It was a thing that was al-Kushayri or whatever, his uh, Qashani, his disciple was the one who coined that. But I mean, the 14th century is roiled with the controversy, with the Ibn Arabi controversy and the wahdat al-wujud controversy and Ibn Taymiyyah is out there. and. These guys are probably, when they decide to go for Ibn al-Khatib, yes, they were his political rivals, but they're probably like, hey, you know, we can make this stick because everybody's all up in arms about, um, about this Wata de Wujud stuff. And a lot of people have combed through, uh, the, or not a lot of people, um, some people, a few people, have combed through the Riyadh the, the Tarif looking for, um, looking for heresy. And it's not easy to put your finger on. I think he knew that he was, he knew the context in which he was writing and he knew things that he shouldn't say, right? Um, but I keep coming back to the fact that there's this lady tree at the center of it. And he addresses her as a lady. You know, shajara, um, which it's it's really cool, and the fact that it's not known, it's not present in discussions really of late medieval um, mysticism. It should be, uh, and it should be present in the discussion of Christian stuff too, because they go wild of the Spanish stuff. They go wild with trees. Um, it's it's really we're missing out by ghettoizing this this whole chunk of late medieval um, spirituality, cultural spirituality that is ironically so incredibly well documented. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because what you're suggesting is that in order to really enrich our and enliven our understanding of space and, and ornament, we really have to turn, or we can't really ignore like, things like ritual, theological texts and mystical texts. No, I mean, it, this, this idea of the Granada, the Granada establishment has just been weirdly, and this I think goes back to part of the field developing or what happened to it under Franco, is in order to make it acceptable, and to, to a certain extent, Mulejar is a problem of, is a product of this tendency before Franco, to make it acceptable, you Christianize it. Right, and there's the there's the um, Miguel Asim Palacios, who again is a, a, a scholar. Scholarship on mysticism would not be what it is without him. But he very he has an agenda of Christianizing Ibn Arabi, which or Christianizing Sufism. You know, looking for looking beneath there because down in there because they're more they're more okay with holy people than Islam is supposed to be, and so. 
you know, underneath there, I'm sure they were really Christians, right? Um, and so that, um, or they just, or saying that Ibn al-Khatib's treatise is politica, which is, he did write political treatises, but this is not one of them. Um, and so I think by not, by not taking this stuff seriously, and there's a number of fields that don't take it seriously, um, we're really missing out on a comparative element. Like, wouldn't it be cool to know, to be able to compare the reception of Ibn Arabi in Egypt to the reception of Ibn Arabi in Turkey, where we know he was hugely important and continues to be, to the reception of Ibn Arabi in the West? Um, because it's not like he left and no one ever talked about him again. I mean, you know, Ibn Khatib mentions him. He was aware of, of Ibn Arabi's doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, so by just considering Al-Andalus this weird, oh, well, they got Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Where in the late Middle Ages in the Mediterranean region did they not have Muslims, Christians, and Jews? Everywhere. I mean, it, the configurations were different. Right, the state, the way they were managed politically was different. Um, Al Andalus is probably different in the longevity. Like, if you compare the context of Al Andalus to the Crusades, Al Andalus is much more organic. It went on for a long time. The Crusades is the result of picking up a bunch of people and, you know, that had no concept of the culture except as the Holy Land and, you know, sticking them on a boat and, you know, going over there and say, okay, let's take Jerusalem from these Arabs. Um, so that's, that's different. But in order to really understand the different nuances of how cultures interact, um, we need points of comparison. And the fact that all Andalus just still gets studied as something apart, um, and I, I'm as guilty as the next person. I mostly publish on Al Andalus, um, but maybe the generation after mine. Sure. You know, like, let's be honest. I'm just going to go write novels. I may never write the Nasser book. Um, <laughs> I'm five years from retirement, or six or seven. Um, I'm eager to retire so that I can just write novels. Um, I may write the Nasser book because um, I think someone needs to write it, but. I'm also just incredibly consumed right now with the other kind of writing that maybe maybe that's a good uh, segue to talk to us about your fiction writing because you've taken on this really fascinating journey through art and mysticism and theology and ritual and now um, for those that aren't aware not only are you well respected as an art historian but also as a fiction writer and I was wondering if you could speak to us about whether the experience of writing fiction has changed the way perhaps you look at, I mean, even though you mentioned that you've always been doing fictional writing, but, you know, has it, has the process of doing something, of, of practicing something, of doing the craft of writing changed the way that you look at the sources or changed the way that you experience building? Definitely. And I, I would just correct, I wasn't always doing writing. I stopped. But when I went down the black hole of tenure track, I had to stop. Mm. And I did. I stopped completely. I stopped even reading fiction wow. because it was just too painful for me. I, I just couldn't do it. And I really kind of poured my, the soul that you would pour into the other stuff went into, went into a period of insane scholarly productivity that lasted for about 15 years. Oh my goodness. Like crazy amounts of stuff that I was pumping out. Um, then I went, like I said, I think it was when I turned, there was just a series of weird coincidences that made me go back to this. And for a while I was doing both. Um, when I was getting the Imagining the Passion book out, um, I was doing both. And I haven't written, I guess my last scholarly, I was looking to see if I had a copy of it. It's a, a study of Dar al Hurra, which is a Nasrid palace that's contemporary with the Alhambra. It's in Spanish. It's a series of, of essays that I co edited with Barbara Boloix that came out two years ago, where we sidebar um, 
figured out, we believe, that this palace that everyone always thought belonged to the mother of Boabdil, the final sultan, the very pious Aisha or Fatima or however she got called, I think we finally settled on, on Aisha. Um, no, it belonged to Boabdil's daddy's Christian mistress. Okay. Which is no, oh, that's better, right? Whoa. Um, and so that's okay. obviously the next novel after this one. <laughs> Isabel de Solis. Uh, she was known as a, a Zahra. And um, two of her sons would have been in line to the Nasrid throne. I mean, it is just, it is awesome. Um, love that. So that's clearly going to make its way into fiction. Um, and it was because I tried to play with genre. I tried to play with the thriller. Okay. Um, and I guess that's something you don't do. Um, but it still, it came out with it. I'm proud of where it came out. And we had some really near misses with some big ones. Um, and it, it addresses uh, sexual violence. Um, it let me get some stuff exercised that I needed to exercise um, from my own past about that. And um, I, what I hear from people, people really like it, the people who read it. It's a literary thriller and, you know, it, it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. And that apparently was, you know, you can't sell people thrillers that don't, you know, behave like thrillers. This one is much more based in my area of expertise. Um, it's called The Neck Ring of the Dove, which is stealing the title from Ibn Hazm. And I've given him so many footnotes over the years that I'm sure he doesn't mind that I stole his title. Um, and it's, uh, it's, about, it's, a, it's about a suicide pact. It's about two um, scholars. Uh, the, the woman is a medievalist. She's not me, um, but a lot of her may sound like me, but a lot of her is not me. You have to distance yourself. If, if you're going to make it yourself, you should write memoir because you can't make a character out of something that's too close to you. Um, and it's set in a hotel in London that I have cause to know about. Um, her lover, her married lover, is a scholar of uh, Duncan Grant of the Bloomsbury Group. And so one of the things that this novel has allowed me to do is to dig so deep into early 20th century thought and poetry, follow the threads back to Mallarmé. And um, I've realized that kind of all art, or at least all the art I've been touching to do with this, whether it wants it through God or it wants it through the intellect or it wants it through hashish or it wants it through, you know, ecstasy or whatever. It wants wedged and muta wedged. That's what it's all going for. Right? Well, a press that, uh, that you're happy with. I really hope so. Uh, well, I was happy with Standing Stone, but I want to be able to go to the Dean and be like, yo, hello, look at this. And you know, you and I know that there's certain presses that get that reaction and certain ones that don't. Absolutely. And so we got to get that reaction. My agent knows that. He's, he's, a, he's a good guy. He knows that there's a lot riding on it. No pressure! <laughs> well, we're wishing you all the best from here anyway, Professor. Thank, Thank you so much. It was really, I really enjoyed talking to you. It was our pleasure. Mm -hmm.